Hi, I'm Reb Myron. I'm a minister through Pathways of Light, and I've been a Course in Miracles student for 40 years. <clears throat> I decided this year to read the text again, and so I'm going through it a paragraph at a two at a time, paragraph maybe two at a time, asking Jesus for clarity, and then I write from that clarity, and that's what I'm sharing with you today. So today we're looking at Chapter 3, Section 2, Miracles as True Perception. And we just started this section. It's always exciting to start a new section. <clears throat> so let's start with paragraph 1. I have stated that the basic concepts referred to in this course are not matters of degree. <clears throat> Certain fundamental concepts cannot be understood in terms of opposites. It's impossible to conceive of light and darkness or everything and nothing as joint possibilities. They are all true or all false. It is essential that you realize your thinking will be erratic until a firm commitment to one or the other is made. A firm commitment to darkness or nothingness, however, is impossible. No one has ever lived who was, has not experienced some light and some thing. No one, therefore, is able to deny truth totally, even if he thinks he can. It was when I finally really understood that my commitment had to be total, the most recent shifts in my understanding occurred. <clears throat> even though Jesus tells us this early in the Course, I just could not seem to grasp the idea for a long time. I'm so used to the idea of choices that I could not understand a lack or of degree or the idea of no opposites. Maybe the first time I began to accept that there could be no opposite or degree was when I read Lesson 152, The Power of Decision is My Own. It says in part, <clears throat> no one can suffer loss unless it be its own decision. No one suffers pain except his choice elects a state for him. No one can grieve nor fear nor think him sick unless these are the outcomes that he wants. And no one dies without his own consent. Nothing occurs but represents your wish and nothing is omitted that you choose. Here is your world, complete in all details. Here is its whole reality for you. And it is only here salvation is. You may believe that this position is extreme and too inclusive to be true. Yet can truth have exceptions? If you have the gift of everything, can loss be real? Can pain be part of peace? Or grief of joy? Can fear and sickness enter in a mind where love and perfect holiness abide? Truth must be all-inclusive if it be the truth at all. Accept no opposites and no exceptions, for to do so is to contradict the truth entirely. Salvation is a recognition that the truth is true and nothing else is true. I was a long way from fully accepting this is true when I read it the first time, but something in me responded to this lesson. Some part of me recognized the truth of it and knew how important these words were. Of course, the ego responded by reminding me that if this is true, then I am one guilty woman. It completely ignored that it was saying that I can only be what God created and everything else must be false. All the ego mind heard was that I had made a mess of things and had no one but myself to blame. Even so, I recognized that this lesson was my way home. At first, I spent some time insisting there must be exceptions to it. After all, I reasoned, so many things have been part of my life that have nothing to do with me and my actions, and so many things I could not possibly be responsible for. I finally came to understand that this lesson was absolutely true. But to do that, I had first to accept that it is true always and in every case, 
no matter what it looks like. I had to learn to disregard appearances and know that Jesus would not say this unless it were true. From this place of rock steady faith, I began to understand how it is that I'm responsible for all things in my awareness and how knowing this can help me let go of the things that are not true. I learned to accept no opposites and no exceptions. When I became confused and could not understand how it was I was responsible, I learned not to say this can't be true, but instead I would say, how could this be true? This represents a simple change in attitude, but the change that made the difference. I'm now firmly committed to certain principles. This certainty makes it easier to allow my mind to be healed. Yes, sometimes my first thought is that someone is guilty, preferably someone else, but I don't believe it. And that thought is quickly followed by the conviction that I have done this to myself and that it is meaningless. I gladly accept the atonement in this situation and open my heart to love, asking that all I have done be undone. Now, paragraph two says this, innocence is not a partial attribute. It is not real until it is total. The partly innocent are apt to be quite foolish at times. It is not until their innocence becomes a viewpoint with universal application that it becomes wisdom. Innocent or true perception means that you never misperceive and always see truly. More simply, it means that you never see what does not exist and always see what does. When I read this paragraph, I felt a longing for innocence to be total. To look at innocence no matter what seems to be happening. I felt a prayer rise up in me, but I also felt sadness because I feel like I haven't met this goal. Nothing is beautiful when I project guilt on it, and I still do this sometimes. One of the things I have been doing lately to help me choose differently is to call it guilt when it is guilt. Here's an example of what I mean. What if I were to say or even think that my friend shouldn't have forgotten my birthday? That would be saying she's guilty of disappointing me. What if I were shopping at Walmart and was disturbed by the woman in front of me? She's casually shopping while her baby is crying relentlessly. My thoughts that she should take care of her child it translates into she is guilty of not being a good mom. Once I see the error clearly, I can ask that love heal me of the belief in guilt. I see that if I continue to believe in guilt, I will see guilt everywhere. It's like I wear guilt glasses so that it is not possible to see anything through them without also seeing guilt. Wearing guilt glasses every time I see someone with breathing problems, I will wonder if they smoke. Or to say this more honestly, I will wonder if that person is guilty of smoking and so causing, guilty of causing their own suffering. Wearing these glasses, I read the paper and I think, how awful, how sad, how ridiculous. I hear about a politician making choices I can't understand, and I wonder if he took a bribe or if he's just self-serving. Every thought that expresses a wish that things were different than they are is an expression of guilt. It is a wish for someone or something to be guilty. It starts to feel overwhelming. How do I stop thinking like this? How do I stop finding everyone and everything guilty? Recognizing that it is not this person or that thing that is a problem is a first step. For instance, my friend who appears thoughtless is not the problem. It is my belief in guilt that's a problem. When I believe in guilt, seeing her thoughtless of my feelings triggers a fear that I'm not worthy and loved. Looking outward, it seems to be her fault. I feel like this. <clears throat> On the other hand, I can turn inward when I feel distressed and look for the answer there. It is the only place I'll find it. If I feel loved by someone else, I must not love myself. If I feel unloved by someone else, I must not love myself. If I can ask the Holy Spirit to remind me of who I am in God, then that will disappear. Um, I am his Holy Son, created by love as love. 
How could I not be lovable? As my mind clears of the ego interpretation of the event, I am free of the need for others to prove my worth. Now I can extend the love I am to them, to everyone. I will start seeing everyone as innocent. With guilt, someone is to blame. Without guilt, the story continues to unfold, and I use each moment as an opportunity to be the love that I am. Without guilt, all moments are peaceful. With guilt, all moments are a battle. It's not the moment that is the problem. It is the guilt. <clears throat> Here's what I learned to do. I notice that I'm blaming myself or someone else or some situation. I know this must be a mistake because there's only innocence. There's only God and God is not guilty. So there cannot be anything but innocence. If I see something besides innocence, there is a need for the atonement. I open my mind and invite love to enter. I ask that love heal my mind of anything that is not like itself. The mind that believes in guilt and values guilt will not want to accept this. It will want to make exceptions so that it can hold on to guilt. It will want to say that my friend's the friend is thoughtless. It will say that the politician really is unscrupulous and there is proof that this is true. The ego mind that loves separation and specialness will cling to its judgments and find many uses for guilt. I will disregard them all. No exceptions, no excuses, just innocence, no matter what. How do I respond? With love, no matter what. What do I do when I notice a desire to judge and to find guilty? I forgive it. I forgive myself. I forgive my projections. I do this by accepting the atonement. That is, by accepting the healing power of love. It's simple. Every time I do this, wipe, I wipe another smudge of guilt off my glasses. And I see things differently. I see more clearly. I see love instead of guilt because love was all was there all the time. The belief in guilt simply obscured it. As the belief in guilt is healed, the ego's effort to convince me that guilt has a place and is justified becomes ridiculous. It's up to us which perspective we live, we view the world. Let us all toss the dirty, smudged guilt glasses. Instead, we can choose to view the world through clear love glasses. We will begin to see what is actually there rather than what the split mind imagines is there. <clears throat> I was also thinking about this sentence. The partly innocent are apt to be quite foolish at times. I remember when I was still learning that there is only innocence. I would see someone acting foolishly and would tell myself they were innocent. True enough, but it was not the ego that was innocent. In the world, the ego can be pretty awful, but that does in no way change who we are in truth. When I was still confused about this, I was often conflicted. I had a woman who cleaned my house. She was a bipolar addict and would steal from me. I let this behavior go on for a long time because I was trying to be a good <laughs> course student. I didn't want to judge her. And in my mind, that meant it was okay for her to steal from me. I was foolish. Now, if that happened, I would not judge her. I would know she was not her story and that her true self was not guilty of anything. I would forgive any thoughts in my mind that were judgmental. And I would let love purify the relationship, removing anything that was not love then I would fire her. <laughs> I didn't do either of us any favors by letting her steal from me. It only increased her guilt <clears throat> and hid my judgments from myself. Hidden judgments cannot be corrected. I'm no longer so foolish. So I thank you so much for joining me in this sharing. I hope that you found it helpful. If you did, then please like it. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe. And thanks to those who subscribed recently. Appreciate it so much. I'll be back tomorrow with another lesson, another sharing. <laughs> and I, I'll see you there. Bye-bye.